keto freaks, this is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them and for you. I've created music to code by. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to Baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to Two Keto Do's. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. And no drugs, by the way. Nice. As of now, I'm 76 pounds lighter. Ooh. Or am I 77 today? I can't remember. Well, anyway, I have no signs of diabetes <laughs> or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, and I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes, and within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 80 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. And this shows a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. <laughs> so we have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind that. We hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat, especially in this episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, but every episode we both share a keto recipe that can't be ignored. Lots of them today. So let's start podcast number 39. Yeah. Thanksgiving 2016. <laughs> All right, buddy. Do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Uh, last week was an awesome show. That was the uh, the Dave show where we spoke about cholesterol hacking. Yeah. Um, I don't believe we've got any uh, any errata from that show, uh, but I'm hoping people will write in and tell us anything that they noticed that we said wrong. And what a great show that was. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. All right. So let's take a recap of what the ketogenic diet is. Yeah. We follow a low-carb, high-fat, moderate-protein diet diet. That's right. Low carb, meaning low to zero, 20 grams a day or less. Although we end up usually eating five or 10 grams a day, but it yeah. doesn't really matter. In incidental carbs. Don't get energy from carbohydrate. You know, if there's carbohydrates in your leafy greens, you know, yeah. as long as you're under 20 grams a day, you'll probably, you'll probably be fine. And I've, I've observed that I can eat all the leafy greens I want and not get kicked out of ketosis. So yeah. eh, you really don't have to worry about those. 
Any, at least I don't think anyway. It's things like it's things like nuts, which have a lot of fat right. and, and protein in them, but you know they also have some carbohydrates. And if you eat a whole handful of nuts, uh, all yep. of a sudden you start craving more nuts and more. Don't and eat then, a whole bag of macadamias. <laughs> That's not good. Ask me no, how it's I know. Not. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to ask you how you know. <laughs> I've done that a couple of times. Well, yeah, anyway, um, protein scales with how much lean body mass you have. So we That's use right. a calculation of one to one and a half grams of protein per day per kilo per kilogram of lean body mass. Yeah, that's. it really depends how much uh, exercise you do. If you're doing a lot of exercise, you want to have more. And one and a half, you know, you may find that you need more than that. I, I noticed yeah. after my last fast – I did a ten day fast, and I've I've been craving a lot more protein than I normally have, um, and I suspect it's just my body um, reaching an equi- equilibrium back again. So you will crave protein food, you will crave that savoury flavour, mm-hmm. and maybe you need to go higher on that. And sometimes, if you're not craving it, um, try going lower. So anyway, yeah. And after a while, you probably want to start doing intermittent fasting, which is what we do now, but we certainly don't recommend that at the beginning. But yeah. uh, go back to the Newbie show and listen to that whole thing. Or the um, the other show that we did where we really talked about this is the Eating Patterns show. Right, yeah. So, But the, the main thing about keto is that we get all of our energy from fat. Yeah. We're using protein to build our bodies. We're not using it to burn for energy. Right. We're not burning carbohydrate for energy. We're using fat both on our bodies and on our plate uh, as a nice, safe fuel source. Yep, and safe it is. Mm. So, buddy, how was your week? Yeah, it was great. I've, As you know, I, I did a 10-day fast that stopped last week and... Uh, I've been over the past week, as I mentioned be, mentioned before, I've been craving a lot of protein. So I've been having uh, a little bit of extra protein in my meal. So I've been, mm. and I find a really easy way to add protein to a meal is to uh, have shrimp. Mm. I made uh, salmon in a bag in the sous vide machine this week, and I put a couple of peeled raw frozen shrimp in a bag with a bit of butter and some garlic. And just toss that in and basically poach them in butter. Nice. You know, they're mostly protein. So, yeah, they are. So, you know, I, and I've been eating a bit of tuna as well. So I've been e- eating quite a lot of seafood lately. Um, mm. and I've been feeling great. I, I've, I've, I retraced a little bit. I, I dropped almost eight kilos and then I, I retraced about three and a half kilos the next, the next two days as I refilled my gut. Mm. So the next time that somebody states that I'm full of it, <laughs> I can state categorically that at least three and a half kilograms, be- I know because I measured it. <laughs> oh, you're sick. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had a great week. How, how was yours? Well, I had a great week too. I've been using the left side of my brain quite a bit lately uh, on some software. And every yeah. once in a while, as my wife will tell you, I get that either I have to go to the studio and make music or mm. I have to, you know, pull all nighters and write software. <laughs> one or the other. So, yeah. uh, I was in left brain extreme mode this week. And so, you know, your brain needs a lot of energy when you're, when you're yeah. doing a lot of, uh, head work, so to speak. And what I did was for like three days, all I, I swear to God, all I ate was pepperoni and pub cheese, which is, just, you know, cheese spread, but yeah. no zero carbs, pepperoni and cheese. And, uh, when I got hungry and I tried to not eat and not eat and not eat in the morning. And then, uh, instead of having bulletproof coffee, first thing, what I did is I had my regular coffee and then about 11 or 12, when I got a little bit hungry, I just take a spoonful of, uh, coconut oil. Yeah. And that would keep me going for another three hours. I think I think the hippies would call that a deconstructed bulletproof coffee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's all about the timing. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh so I had a great week. I was just living on pepperoni and cheese and maybe some olives and some coconut oil and um if I was going to eat a meal I eat like half or a third of what I normally do just cuz I didn't really care. Just didn't want it. So Yeah, well our brains are so metabolically active and uh, you know the, yeah. the harder you work it the more um, energy they're going to chew through. They, I mean, they they say that the brain and the heart each account for forty percent of your total energy. So yeah. you know, it doesn't leave a lot left to be cycling around lakes and stuff. But, yeah, you know. Well, so here's a tip for you, kids. If uh, you want to burn some fat, you know, and get into a, a rhythm where you're not hungry and just burning a lot of body fat, 
do some head work, do some thought work. Yeah, cut some code. Yeah, well, if you're a developer, write some code. But you know, if you're not, write a book. Yeah, sit down and idea. write. Uh, just use your brain. Mm. Don't uh, waste it on television <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> Or listening to silly podcasts, yeah, two podcasts. guys who think they know something about <laughs> nutrition. <laughs> hey, we're just dudes. <laughs> we're, dudes right. we're dudes on the internet with opinions. But we can cook. We can cook and, and we can find the science to back up what we're saying. At, That's right. At least most of the time we can. All right. Well, we got a couple of pieces of... Mail! <laughs> Well. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll start this time. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of messages in our Facebook group, which you can join at fb.2keto.com. Mm -hmm. This one is from Christian. And Christian says, is there anyone on here who's gone keto for any other reason than weight loss or diabetes control? If so, what? And what benefits are you seeing? That's an awesome question because both Carl and I really did this for diabetic control, glucose control, more more so than weight loss. I mean, weight loss is really something that, that for me, I only speak for myself, weight loss for me was a secondary benefit. The primary mm. benefit was getting glucose control because I was, in, I was in a really bad state. I was literally about to lose a toe. Yeah. And I really didn't want to get there either. Yeah. I, it's exactly why I went on it. But there was a lot of great responses. Yeah. So let's read some of them. So Amber says, I started keto to stop migraines. I didn't want to take the narcotics associated with migraine treatment. Right. So I started researching and here I am today. Controlling what I eat has not only stopped migraines, but has helped with anxiety, inflammation, and chronic sinus infections. Wow. Yeah, Jillian mentioned uh, migraines as well. She says, I wish I'd known about this way of eating before I had to go on migraine meds. Not only were they awful to take, but I gained so much weight. Finally took myself off everything four years ago and feel much better. Um, and and she says, you know, good good luck for, for anyone starting this for, for migraines and good luck with their health. Yeah. Well, and uh, Jen said, my mom isn't on here, but she started to lower her blood pressure and decrease inflammation. Yeah. Blood, and inflammation is something we see across the board, which is a natural result of uh, high insulin levels. It is, yeah. Um, blood pressure was lowered within days and continues to go down. Inflammation started to noticeably decrease after about a week. It's slower, but getting better all the time. Yeah. It, and it, the, as soon as your insulin drops, you start excreting more salt mm. and your Blood pressure goes down. I suspect from osmotic um, uh, pressures, if your blood is more salty, you're drawing liquid into your blood from surrounding tissue. Yep. Um, and so I suspect that, that that may have something to do with it. But it happened for me as well. I was on uh, hypertensive medication. Uh, high blood pressure or hypertension is one of these uh, diseases that comes along with the metabolic syndrome along with diabetes yeah. and heart disease. And it's all part of a complexus of diseases that all seem to point back to insulin. So, yeah. um, you know, I would almost say that high blood pressure is really uh, part of the same disease as diabetes so um but but it's it definitely for just about everybody i know who's gone keto has uh, who's been hypertensive beforehand has uh, noticed it dropped in the first week yeah yeah so we have one from Carol, who's one of our admins, and she says that I admit that weight loss was the thing that got me researching it, but since I have a family history of cancer on one side and diabetes slash heart disease on the other, I figure I might be able to outrun that stuff with keto as well. Mm. And then there's also the cognitive benefits. Yeah. As I was just saying, the mental acuity mm. is just amazing. I'm not so sure I could have done what I did in the last three days, you know, code-wise, without, uh, without being fat-fueled. Yeah, I know Karen Mangiacotti said she notoriously for the first almost two months gained weight on keto. Right. And she's one of the few who has. And she said the thing that kept her in it was that she was writing a book or a screenplay at, this, at the time and it gave her mental focus. It gave her clarity mm. that, that she, she never had as a glucose burner. So even though she was gaining weight uh, and she wanted to lose weight, even though she was gaining weight, she stayed for the mental clarity, which she got almost immediately. 
Well, we don't want to read all of these replies, but we'll do a couple more. This one is from Lee. And Lee says, yes, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia or fibromyalgia wow. two years ago. I was so sick I couldn't get out of bed. I started looking into natural remedies and found a fantastic supplement program, but it didn't get me all the way into remission. Hmm. About a year ago, I started dabbling more with my diet to get rid of my inflammation. I noticed how much that helped. I'm trying to put my incurable disease into complete remission, so I'm starting on the keto. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's been three weeks now, and I can definitely tell that my inflammation is way down. I'm much more comfortable, and I'm not having hot flashes. Mm. Hmm. My digestive issues are cleaning up nicely, unless I eat too much swerve, <laughs> which is a sweetener. <laughs> yeah. Disaster uh, pants. <laughs> dis <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good on you, Lee. Yeah, good on you, Lee. So uh, anyway, that we have a, maybe 100 responses to that thread, and I suggest if you're interested in the kinds of things that keto can do for you, um, go to fp.2keto.com and uh, join our group, and uh, you'll see that thread with uh, lots of great content. Yeah. So we got another one, right, Richard? Yeah, we do. We've got one from Becky, and Becky says that my keto journey – has been a cooking awakening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love cooking again. I love to cook. I was known for my cooking and baking. I went gluten-free five years ago, and while I felt physically better, mentally I was off my love of cooking, and it was a mess. Mm. So she talks a lot about food restrictions that she's gone through over these five years. But yeah. she comes to the end, and she talks about being addicted to food and angry at food, and we've all gone through that. But So she says, after three months on keto, I still have moments like this. I still binge at times, but it's keto binges, thank goodness. And then I pull myself back to keto and self-control. Thank you for keto for helping me experience this. Mm. I then read in the Two Keto Dudes group, and I tell myself, I can, I will, I deserve strong health. I deserve to be seen as more than my fat. Not sure why I had to get this out today, but I'm grateful for a form to write this in. Keep calm and keto on. <laughs> and I would say keep calm and cook on. Yeah, cook on. <laughs> and I, I got to say, I you know exactly what Becky's talking about. Before, when I was a sugar burner... Uh, mm -hmm. and I would go off the rails and do emotional eating. Oh, yeah. Some, you know, of course it would all be carbs and I would yeah. gain weight and I, I would feel hopeless and helpless. Like I couldn't control it. And sometimes I would put on 20 pounds before I stopped and came wow. to my senses and said, you know, I'm going to have to, uh, take this off now. And of course the the net gain is what happens, you know, you, you can never get a hold of it. Yeah. And so now, um, you know, I don't have emotional eating, but I have these periods where I get hungrier than other times. Sure. And instead of binging on, you know, crap, which I consider poison yeah. now. Slippery slope. Yeah. I binge on keto and uh, and it's great. Yeah. And I don't put on any weight or if I do, it comes right off the next day. It's like, it's just amazing. I've got, I've got to admit, cooking for me was the necessary technology to enable my prolonged weight loss. Me too. Uh, it was getting interested in cooking, and uh, I, I, I suspect that it's uh, cooking is an essential step towards having a healthy relationship with food. And I, I tell people with young kids this that if they want to inoculate their children against obesity, uh, then they should teach them how to cook. Teach them the the ingredients that go in to make a meal. Um, play the game when you go to a restaurant. How would you make this meal? And uh, you know yeah. that kind of thing. And inculcate in your kids a love of the production of food. And yeah. you'll find that they uh, you'll find that they're more able to uh, to be aware of what they're eating. Uh, and uh, as I say, have a more healthy relationship with food. Yeah. So uh, I know exactly what you mean, Richard. And uh, I I do the same with my kids. We watch used to watch cooking shows together. And yeah, I, I never played that game of how would you make this in a restaurant, but I love that idea. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. But it, man, cooking has been on my mind today because- You've had a big day. I did have a big day. <laughs> I've been researching what I was going to do for Thanksgiving for a couple of days. And then I went shopping this morning and I spent the whole day in the kitchen. Nice. And uh, I had friends and family over for dinner. It was about seven of us and uh, served Thanksgiving dinner early. We're about three weeks before Thanksgiving. We're, we're recording currently uh, in early November, and uh, Thanksgiving's towards the end of November, right? Yep, that's right, November 24th this year on Thursday. 
Now, I'm, I'm Australian. We don't have Thanksgiving in Australia, but I lived in America for eight years. And so I, I, in fact, within two months of moving to the States, I had my first Thanksgiving with a Cuban-American family, and that was in Tense. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I got a, I got an early introduction to it. Yeah. It's one of those holidays that uh, has always stuck with me. Uh, it's an American holiday, but many cultures have both a holiday in which they give thanks, mm. but also maybe an autumn festival. That, and it might be the same holiday, but there's generally, uh, it's all about seasonal foods. Yeah, it's like post harvest, you know? really, isn't it? So you do all the right. work, you get the harvest in, you get, and then you have a big feast and be thankful for the, for the year's bounty. Yeah, for the bounty, exactly. Mm. And um, so I, I, and Canadians have Thanksgiving, but they have it in October, and it's called Thanksgiving. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but it's different. You know, it's different. In America, we've got this lore built up around Thanksgiving. You know, the pilgrims came over on the Mayflower, right. and uh, they settled, and they all starved to death. And if it yeah. weren't for Squanto and the Indians who showed them how to plant corn, and maybe they had some pheasant and stuff, and they had this big peace offering... And then we beat the living snot out of them. So. <laughs> well, they did. They did introduce you to corn, so right. <laughs> those carbs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I found that uh, I was reading a great book by Bill Bryson called "Made in America." Okay. And he tells the story of Tisquantum, or Squanto for short. But uh, Tisquantum, in 1614, was captured in Massachusetts by Captain Thomas Hunt, mm. who was a lieutenant for Captain John Smith, who lured him and 23 other friendly Native Americans on board Hunt's ship okay. uh, with the promise of trade. And then, of course, they locked him up. And yeah. uh, f there's the, the record is vague whether he landed in Spain or not. But it, eventually, he made his way to England. And there he was uh, an interpreter for Captain Thomas Dermer. Wow. And uh, so this was all happening before the pilgrims landed in March of 1621. Wow. But uh, anyway, let's talk turkey, shall we? So Thanksgiving's not Thanksgiving without turkey, right? Yeah, that's right. Why is that? Apparently because of the lore, right? You know, the, okay. the first Thanksgiving was between the settlers and the Native Americans, and they basically cooked a bird of some kind. Most people will say it's a pheasant, but, you know, in the popular culture, it was a turkey because yeah. turkeys are everywhere in America. And turkeys are American. They are. Uniquely American, whereas pheasants you know, get all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I've done for turkey since I can remember when I can't I can't ever remember it's been probably 20 years I've been cooking a turkey this way right. using the Julia Child method okay and I talked a little bit about this on the show where I talked about the stuffing but and we'll get to that but the basic idea is that you debone it you take out the backbone which is connected to the breast yeah and you you basically cut down the sides of the backbone and uh, snip it out. So it's like a spatchcock then, is it? you spatchcocking it? Well, spatchcock takes it a little bit further. Okay. And you take out the backbone and then you split it so yeah. it's flat. Right. Yeah. Yep. So it's one step towards spatchcocking, but not okay. quite all the way. So basically, then you take the legs off at the mm -hmm. thighs. Yep. And take the femur out of the thighs. That's the thigh bone. Yep. And replace it with herbs and salt. And sort of roll that up together, and you actually end up cooking the breast and wing over stuffing, and then you end up cooking the legs and thighs together in a separate pan, which takes less time than the breast does. Yeah. So you can uh, wait a half an hour before you put that in the oven. Yeah. And the whole thing takes half the time uh, of a traditional turkey where everything's roasted overnight. But the whole trick of it getting a turkey done right is you want it tender and juicy on the inside, not dry, mm. and then yeah. have that crispy skin on the outside. That's oh, the whole yeah. holy grail. The skin is the good stuff. <laughs> so this year, however, um, I decided to do all thighs. Okay. Because you know what? Breast meat is kind of yeah, just dry, boring, boring and dry and proteiny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I want something moist, meaty, and fatty. And everybody else likes breast meat. So, you know, if you're buying your poultry in uh, pieces, then uh, thigh meat's cheaper. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So what I did was I bought four thighs with mm -hmm. the bones in, just the thighs, not the drumsticks. Yep. And then I also bought four chicken breasts. Well, 
two split chicken breasts, so four quarters. Okay. And I cooked those along with the thighs because, you know, for the people who wanted white meat and yeah. there you go. I actually did that because I couldn't find any fresh turkey breast in right. the uh, grocery store today that looked like I wanted to eat it. So. Mm. so here's what I did. I didn't have to take the bird apart, but I did have to remove the bones from the thighs. And, and having a good turkey experience for me is all about the gravy. Yeah. The gravy is key. And it, you really can't make gravy sing unless you make your own stock. Yeah. You know, you make your own bone broth. Yeah. And so what I do for that is I take those femur bones and I put them in some olive oil. I, I added some sage and rosemary yeah. and I just cook them on medium heat in a, in a, in a pot. And I let that go and turned it over and turned it over and let them get crispy and brown. And man, that starts smelling so good. You get it at the milliard reaction going and yeah. uh, those bones get all crispy. Then I add some garlic, chopped garlic, yeah, and about a half a gallon of water. Bring that all to a boil. As soon as it gets to a boil, reduce it down to a simmer and let it cook down. And right. I still want to see bubbles yeah. because I want the steam evaporating. Yeah. So it's 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 reducing and getting really delicious. One trick you can do with uh, with reducing sauces is you get a desk fan and you put it over the over the pot and you have it blow across the pot and what it does is it takes away all of the steam that's above the pot so that it so that it encourages more to be produced. Wow, so, that's a great yeah, idea. It works really well. Yeah, you only need a, sm only need a small little fan. That's so great. Just I'm going to do that, that next time. Move that air. Wow, yeah. it'll, it'll double, I, I, double the speed. No kidding. Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay. So then you lay the thighs open yeah. and you put your herbs in there. And I like fresh herbs like sage and rosemary. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to put a little garlic in there too, you can do that. A little salt and pepper, whatever you like. But but the sage is the most critical herb here, I think. Yeah. It's very easy to grow your own herbs. And you know, uh, it, it's one of the first things, if, if you were deciding to grow your own plants, Herbs would be one of the first because they can take a beating. You can uh, yeah. you can have black thumbs and still <laughs> and still grow parsley. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I also cooked these chicken breasts, as I said, and the, what I did for those is I put them in a zip bag. Oh yeah, with water, salt, and garlic powder, and I just put them in the fridge to let them brine for a couple hours. Sure. And, you know, brining overnight would have been better, but a couple hours is still pretty good. Yeah. And then I took those out of the bag and patted them dry so they didn't have any water on them. Nice. Yeah. Uh, took all of these things, the, the breasts in one pan and the, the legs in another pan, the turkey in another pan. But before I put them in the pan, I took about two teaspoons of bacon grease from my stash mm. and I spread that all over the bottom of the pan. Nice. That just is going <laughs> to... Oh, How good is bacon grease? <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah, health food. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, it's it really a is. diet. <laughs> no, I know, it's terrible. So, so uh, you got bacon smeared on the pan, right? Yeah, exactly. So I got bacon spread on the pan. I put the thighs in one pan. I put the chicken breasts in another. Those yeah. go in a 350 oven. And for me, they were small, so it was about an hour and a half total, but... Mm. Bigger thighs, you might have to cook for two hours, yeah. maybe two and a half, maybe two and a quarter. You'll have to check them. So while that's going, I'm simmering down my stock, and about 30 minutes before the meat is done, yeah. I strain the stock through a strainer yep. or a sieve or a mesh or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And so now I just have the liquid, and I just put that aside to cool. Now, there's a reason that it's got to cool okay. because I'm going to thicken it with xanthan gum. Ah, so you don't use a roux. No. Which is traditional way is using flour, right? Yeah, traditional way is using flour. And I never really liked flour gravy. It was nice ah. and thick, but it leaves that that uh, aftertaste, that chalky, yeah. floury aftertaste, right? The texture. That particular kind of white gravy is a very American thing. I noticed I, I'd never seen mm. it before I moved to America and then I saw it everywhere. So um, yeah. for people outside America, you probably wouldn't be used to it, but it's a, it's a white, it's a white gravy. Yeah. It's basically flour and butter and salt yeah, and right. some, you know, if you're and really stock. terrible, yeah. you use not stock, but you'd yeah. use bouillon, <laughs> you know, it's just nasty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 
So after the stock cools, and I'm talking 20 minutes at least, okay. you know, and it can't be really hot. Yeah. I'm going to thicken it with xanthan gum by dissolving a quarter teaspoon of xanthan gum in a little bit of olive oil per cup of liquid. Okay. So I got about four cups of liquid, maybe five. Oh, so about a teaspoon. So I used about a teaspoon. Yep. Yeah. And, and what I'm going to do is put that all in a blender and then add the oil with the xanthan gum in there ah, and then blend right. it. And if it's hot, when you blend it, guess what happens? Goes everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Because the steam pops the top off right. and hot liquid goes everywhere, including on you. Yeah. Ask me how I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But you only do that maybe three or four or five or 15 times before you learn your lesson. <laughs> oh, once. <laughs> once was enough. Yeah. But what, what's happening in the blender is that you're going to emulsify that oil with a xanthan gum and you're not going to have right. any granules. Yeah. And the typical problem people have with xanthan gum is they think they can just sprinkle it into hot liquid oh, man. and stir no. it <laughs> and that doesn't work. No. Yeah. You're going to end up with little lumps. Clumps, yeah. Clumps and lumps and not very thick. So, so there you go. Now, here's what happens when the turkey comes out. Mm. You take all the drippings from that pan and just mm. add it to the gravy. Yeah. Of course add you do. Add it to the gravy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then you salt and pepper to taste and uh, bring it to the table because you got some hungry people there that wants want to taste that turkey. It's not so much gravy now, it's liquid schmaltz. It's schmaltz. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. That's the Yiddish word for chicken fat. And uh, that, yeah. Nice. Just wonderful. So there's the turkey. Mm. All right, let's move on to the stuffing. Yeah. I talked about the stuffing before on the show. This is a low-carb Thanksgiving sausage stuffing. Some people call it dressing. Sure. So this is exactly the recipe that I would make before... I transform myself with a ketogenic diet, except for the bread. Right. And I use Mahler's low-carb bread for the croutons, and everything mm. else is exactly the same as you'd make stuffing. So if you have a favorite way to make stuffing with chestnuts or mushrooms or whatever, I like to use sage sausage yeah. along with a mirepoix, which is chopped celery, carrots, and mushrooms and garlic yeah. sautéed in an entire stick of butter. Of course. <laughs> And then I just nail it with fresh sage and some thyme and rosemary uh, and some black olives, maybe some onion powder. Mm. And before you add the chicken stock, you need to have the bread in there. So what I do is I toast about seven or eight pieces of Mahler's low-carb bread right. and I chop it up into cubes. Mm. So all of that goes together in your pan with the chicken stock and now you've got a lot of liquid in there. So you've got to sort of simmer it down. Sure. As you're doing that, you know, the, the, the liquid gets absorbed in the, in the bread mm. and it all just gets really happy together and yeah. you have plenty of opportunities to taste it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you do. <laughs> and what's best is that once all that liquid is burned off, there's still the fat in there. There's still the yeah. butter. Oh, and yeah. so you turn it down on low and some of it's going to stick to the bottom of the pan and get crispy. Mm, fond. The fond. Yeah. yeah. So you just, you know, you can keep scraping it off if you want, or you just let it crust up. Yeah. And it's going to be wonderful. Yeah. If you want to do the traditional stuffing the turkey, you can do that too. Yeah. Just put a mound of stuffing on a pan put the breast over it and cook it that way. We don't do that these these days much with uh, with birds. I think this Christmas we're probably going to try and get a goose for the first time in a long time. And we we rarely stuff the actual birds with uh, stuffing mix. Normally just chuck a lemon in there or something like that just to keep the carcass expanded out a bit. Um, oh, that's a great idea from, too. Yeah, prevent it from collapsing in on itself. And then that lemon at the end of it is sort of taking up all of the all of the flavors of the of the bird and uh, – and you could then just mash the lemon into into a stock or something. Yeah, and it's delicious. But the um, the actual stuffing we we cook in a pan on the side by itself because the the thing is if you if you're putting it into a raw bird and then cooking the bird if you if you don't get the bird fully cooked then the inside of that yeah. stuffing is inedible. So it's such yep. a horrible, a wasteful thing to do to such delicious yeah. uh, p potentially delicious food. So yeah. Right. And the good thing about putting a bird over stuffing is that the fat drips down onto the stuffing oh, and yeah. further flavors it. Yeah. But you know what? That's what gravy does too. So, yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, next I did some sides. Let's start yeah. with the broiled Brussels sprouts. I've done this before on Two Keto Dudes. And Richard, it turns out if you take any vegetable, cut it up, add a little olive oil, salt and pepper, and blast it under a broiler, guess what? It's going to taste awesome. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> So you've done broiled vegetables as well. I mean, Brussels sprouts is just the beginning. You can take peppers or mushrooms, onions, bok choy, parsnips, whatever yeah. you want, and yeah. uh, blast them in the broiler, and they taste great. I, I, it's a shame that we've been fed vegetables that taste so crappy all our lives. I know. I mean, that that cream spinach that uh, that I did that, to, uh, I think maybe about 10 episodes ago, we did a cream spinach. Yeah. It's one of my go-tos. And I just love, love spinach. Yeah. <laughs> I never would have thought. I like mushrooms too. Yeah. <laughs> There's all these foods that, that, that until I learned to cook and learned to find out what my own taste preferences were, yeah. um, were horrible steamed vegetables that you get in restaurants. Yeah, because people think vegetables, well, they can't have any fat on them. Otherwise, right. what's the point? No, no, no. Throw that fat on there. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So a couple of uh, classic sides for me, the cream spinach, as I mentioned. Also, I did a recipe once with the pot of marins, which are, they're like a winter squash in Australia. Right. Well, they're actually a French winter squash um, that you pick at harvest time and then you can eat over the whole of the winter. And I just put one of those in an oven with a bit, little bit of butter and then I just slide a knife in to, to make sure that they're perfectly done. Mm. Very easy to cook. And uh, you can even combine the two. You can even put spinach, cream spinach in your pot of marin oh, yeah. and serve it on a plate. So, uh, And we'll post the recipe to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so next I want to talk about mashed potatoes. Yeah, oh yeah. First of all, it's not the potatoes why you like mashed potatoes. Okay, it is if you're carb addicted, but right. the flavor isn't in the potatoes. It's in the garlic and the butter and everything. The potato yeah. is just a, a blank canvas on which to put flavor, right? Yeah, absolutely. So if you start with something more flavorful, like say cauliflower, mm. and mash that up, um, you can actually have something that... Don't compare it to mashed potatoes. Just compare it to mashed cauliflower. It's really, really <laughs> right. good. Yeah. Now, I took this an extra step because a lot of cauliflower mash recipes that I see out there require you to boil or steam the cauliflower. Right. And what that does, it adds a lot of water. Dilutes the flavor. And doesn't really bring out the flavor. It yeah. dilutes the flavor. Yeah. And of course, you don't want runny mashed anything. So mm. why do that? So what I did was, guess what? What? Broiled them. Broiled them. Yeah. I chopped up cauliflower and I added, guess what? Olive oil, gar <laughs> garlic, <laughs> salt, and pepper. And I put uh, it under the broiler. Carl's special seasoning. <laughs> yeah. The difference between this and the Brussels sprouts is the Brussels sprouts go directly under the broiler. Okay. And this I put in the middle rack. A little bit more indirect. A little bit more indirect. I still want the heat, yeah. but I don't want them to, to brown so fast right. before the body of the cauliflower gets thoroughly cool. cooked. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So sometimes sometimes you can put a little bit of uh, foil over the top of them just to stop them from getting that radiant heat so that they, 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 they it stops them from getting the heat directly from the element and they get it from, from the surrounding temperature. Right. Or you could just bake it at 500 degrees instead of broil it. Yeah. yeah. But broiling does crisp the top. And even better, if you have a convection oven, that can add a little bit more. And that's, that's exactly what I did is I, I put them under the broiler for about 30 minutes. In the last 10 minutes, I turned on convection right. and that really crisped up the edges of the cauliflower. Mm, lovely. So 40 minutes later, I take it out and I cooled it off a little bit because I'm going to put it into the food processor. And if it's too hot, there might be a little too much steam, which could condense mm. and turn into water and all yeah. of that. So, so I wanted to just cool it off a little bit, but I did add about three tablespoons of butter, <laughs> butter. and a little heavy cream. Just a little squirt, maybe a couple tablespoons. And that all went into the food processor and it came out the consistency of hummus. Ah, yeah. So slightly grainy, but delicious. Yeah, yeah. And then, and that with intense flavor, like not your typical mashed potato that you could just eat tons and tons and tons of. Mm. This is like seriously dense flavor. Yeah. And that roasted cauliflower flavor. And it, it comes out brown, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you have a small spoonful and the flavor lasts in your mouth for, for minutes. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a different experience from mashed potatoes, but it's better. That sounds awesome. I'm going to I'm going to have to make that. I, I think I'm going to have a th- you're making me want to have a Thanksgiving in Australia. You know that, don't you? All right, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, cranberry relish, cranberry sauce, that's a staple of Thanksgiving in America. Okay. And there are two kinds typically that people will buy. There's mm. the jelly, which it comes in a can and it just goes <laughs> and it pops out in a can, perfect can form. I know, and I've the, seen that. <laughs> there might be a few cranberries hole in there, but probably not. It's, it's just stuck a jelly. The, it's stuck on a plate in the middle of the table. And it's all <laughs> yeah. can shaped. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I've seen it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then there's cranberry sauce, which people will typically either make on a stovetop by boiling down cranberries with uh, sugar. Right. And a little water. Because they're very tart. So they they're very eat, tart. Yeah. Yeah. Or, um, you know, cranberry sauce that comes in a can also, but is more like a sauce, right? Right. So, however, my mother has been making both the cranberry sauce and a cranberry relish from fresh cranberries. Okay. And she has been made ever since I was two. I can't remember a time when we didn't have this. Mm. And she sweetens it with orange juice and puts orange zest in it. And of course, some sugar of some kind L- sure. later on in her life, she would use honey or agave nectar, supposed yeah. good yeah. sugars. Good sugars. <laughs> yeah, good sugars. So Carl, of course, is using scare quotes around good sugars. Yeah, that's right. So, and, and she also added a little ginger to it, which is oh, a nice. really good combination with, mm. with cranberry. Mm. Well, anyway, I did the same, except that I added, uh, instead of orange juice, a little lemon juice and the zest of an entire lemon. Yeah. Nice. And to prepare the cranberries, I I blanched them in boiling water. In other words, I put them in water, brought it to a boil, and then just let them sit for like a minute and that's it. Yeah. So that they wouldn't cook, but they would blanch a little bit. It softens the outside skin. Yeah. Yeah. And then I uh, strain that, put them in the food processor with the zest and a little lemon juice and sweetener to taste. Mm. And I didn't go overboard with the sweetener. And here's why. First of all, we're, we're ketogenic. We don't need yeah. really, really sweet stuff. No. Secondly, you really need that acid to cut through all the fat yeah. of uh, the th- rich gravy and the turkey sure. and the mash, yeah. you know, and, and just a little bit turned out everybody loved it. Mm. You just use a little bit of it. And it's relatively fresh tasting because uh, they're fresh cranberries. They're not yeah. cooked. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering where I'm going to get fresh cranberries in Australia. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to see how I go. Yeah. I could send you some, but I'd probably get arrested. Yeah. No. <laughs> Smuggle it in a boogie board bag. No, I, 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 I think uh, I think I've I think I might be able to find a source. I know I lived in Sweden for two years and when I was younger, and we used to have a relish there called lingonberries, or I think they're sometimes yes. called cowberries. It's a very similar to a cranberry, yeah. And I I, yep. I, I think I saw a, a sugar free lingonberry um, paste, yeah, you know, lingonberry uh, spread. Um, in the delicatessen recently, so I'll see if I can find that because ling- lingonberries would do the same thing. They're they're they're, they're not as tart as cranberries, but they right. they have that they cut they'll cut through that fattiness of your meal. Yeah, so, yeah. And my mother's uh, Swedish, so she's all oh, really? about lingonberries. Yeah. yeah, and that's probably why she was so into the cranberry relish too. Yeah, I love it. I got it. I, I mean, if I can find fresh cranberries, I will totally make this and uh, jar it up and store it for for autumn. Yeah, awesome. Mm. All right. Okay. There's one more thing that I made that I need to talk about, and then I will hand it over to you because you've got some great recipes too. And that is the low carb pumpkin cheesecake mousse from sugarfreemom.com. Nice. So you've got to have pumpkin pie at a Thanksgiving, and this is probably the closest you're going to get yeah. To a pumpkin pie, right? That's a traditional. Right. If I had more time, I would have made a keto crust like out of pecans and oh, erythritol yeah. and butter, yeah. but I didn't do that. And I did use a different sweetener than they say here. Okay. Uh, they they use vanilla liquid stevia. Okay. And I didn't. I used sucrine gold, 
which is an right. erythritol stevia blend, but it is brown sugar-ish. So it's got like a molasses essence added to yeah. the artificial sweetener. So it's, it, yeah, I have seen it. Yeah. I've just never used it. Yep. And I'm, I used it for the first time and it really works well with pumpkin. I mean, mm. if you think about it, the, you know, any any kind of spice, yeah. uh, you know, pumpkin spice thing is going to work really sugar. well with them. Yeah. 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 So here are the ingredients. You need two eight ounce packages of cream cheese at room temperature. Okay. You need a 15 ounce can of pure pumpkin, not the pumpkin pie filling, but just pure pumpkin puree. Mm -hmm. You know, just a can of pumpkin. Yeah, yeah. Two cups of heavy cream, a pinch of salt, two teaspoons of pumpkin pie spice, one to two teaspoons of vanilla liquid stevia or to taste. And I just used the sucrine gold to taste. Uh, I think I ended up with three quarters of a cup of it at the end. Okay. Uh, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, but of course, use more because vanilla is awesome. I don't know. And uh, you can optionally top it with cacao nibs or a little sucrine gold. Okay. But uh, those are the ingredients. So for people outside of America, pumpkin spice is, I guess you could, quattro pieces, the, the, the French sweet four spice blend would probably be closest but it's really i guess cinnamon nutmeg cloves and allspice oh and and allspice right yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. um but in america everything <laughs> everything this time of the year is pumpkin spice flavor and pumpkin spice is one word <laughs> yes it's really em embarrassing i know <laughs> it's uh, delicious pumpkin though. <laughs> spice lattes at starbucks are all the rage oh. yeah so here are the instructions. You start with a KitchenAid or a stand mixer and you blend the cream cheese and the pumpkin until smooth. Now, this is right. cream cheese at room temperature. I didn't start with mine at room temperature and guess what happened? Yeah, clump. <laughs> I got little bits of cream cheese all throughout the mix. Oh, well. Yeah, well. So live and learn. So now you just add the rest of the ingredients and blend until whipped and fully fluffy or about five minutes. And what's great about this is that uh, the cream actually whips. You actually yeah. get the whipped cream effect, so it lightens it up. All yeah, right. Yeah, and just adjust your flavors as needed. I w added more pumpkin pie spice. I added more sucrine gold. I added more salt than they yeah. said because, you know, we're keto and we need more salt. Yeah. And it was unbelievable. Wow. Everybody liked it. I'm so going to do that too. I'm going to do this entire meal. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I got, Richard. Hey, should we play the recipes theme? <laughs> recipes! It's time for recipes! Oh, recipes. A little late, but okay. This, this entire show is recipes. Oh, I'm going <laughs> to do right. a recipe. Now, um, in Australia, we don't have Thanksgiving. What we have is the day after Christmas. Uh, it's called Boxing Day in Australia. It's a, it's a holiday. You have the day off. And we have a lot of sporting events that all start on that day. There's a big Boxing Day cricket match in Melbourne um, where the, if the English are coming out, then it's the, the big Ashes match. It's a five-day sporting event where mo the most likely outcome is a, is a no result. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> and then um, it is kind of, kind of like baseball. Imagine it taking five days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So – uh, so that so there's the cricket and then there's a big sailing race, the Sydney to Hobart yacht race, which is down the eastern seaboard of Australia, which is quite a dangerous race. So that's all very exciting. Um, and so what happens on Boxing Day? These all these sporting events start, and you just had Christmas. You had your family over for uh, some of your family over for Christmas. The ones you like, the ones you don't like, all turn up on Boxing Day, and you and you basically sit around and eat leftovers and watch sport and fall asleep on the couch in front of the sport. So. My uh, my experience of uh, Thanksgiving in America was that's pretty similar similar to a Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very similar. We just try to eat everything in sight. Eat, yep. That's it. It's a it's a competitive eating event. So um, yeah. what we often do in Christmas time in Australia is middle of summer, right? Absolute height of summer, and it's insane because we have these English traditions that we follow of having a ham and having a goose or a turkey or a, you know a, la a large chicken and and lots of hot stodgy food. <laughs> <laughs> it's the middle yeah. of summer, um, but we also, you know, we'll have things like uh, shrimp. So uh, yep. you've heard this shrimp the, on phrase, the shrimp on the Barbie. That's uh, that. We, so we'll have shrimp uh, often uh, uh, on uh, Boxing Day. But 
What we do like to do is we like to cook a ham and then let it go cold and then slice and have cold cuts of, uh, of basically right. ham. Yeah, we do the same thing with ham in America. At least in my family, we did. Uh, we had a turkey and a ham, yeah. usually, and both at Thanksgiving and Christmas. For those who celebrate Christmas, we did. And you eat the ham hot or cold? Both. So right. it starts hot and then it sits out. And then by about midnight, <laughs> when people get peckish, they start making yeah. ham sandwiches with the rolls. Yeah. You know. Fair enough. So I'll give you our recipe. This is one that Julie's been doing for us uh, ever since we went low carb. We get a leg ham, a large leg ham, and we peel the skin back from the top. And you're basically separating that fat layer. So you're ending up with a little bit of fat in the skin, but most yeah. of the fat's on the meat itself. And then right. what we're going to do is we're going to lay a uh, dressing on that meat. And we're going to use miso uh, and apple cider vinegar. And it's basically an app. We're going to make an apple miso um, dressing on the top of that fat. And I'm trying so, to imagine what that tastes like, and it oh, tastes pretty good in my umami, imagination. Yeah. It's very, it, it basically yeah. turns that fat into a very protein flavor, umami sort of. Um, yeah. It's difficult to describe, yeah. but it's, yeah. so we, we use two tablespoons of white miso. Uh, you can get miso, is a, it's a fermented soy mash. So um, you can get white miso or red miso. It's it's a it's an Asian, usually a Japanese um, ingredient. Um, but you get two tablespoons of white miso. You get about one and a half tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. And this is to thin out the miso. Right. We add instead of adding apple juice to it, which is what you traditionally do, we add seven drops of apple flavoring essence, which is an oil oh. based essence that gives a very strong flavor of apple without any of the glucose, without any, any of the sugar. Fructose and wow, glucose. where do you get all these essences? You got an essence of pineapple too, right? Yeah, I I, I use uh, there's there's a website that uh, that specialises in these. I think a lot of people use them for baking, for making uh, flavoured icing mixes. Yeah, okay. So you add a little bit of the the oil essence to the icing, and so you end up with mint flavoured icing or pineapple flavoured icing, apple flavoured icing. So that's really where I get these from. But I'll put the link to uh, the place that Julie uh, buys them from, and so so we. Use uh, seven drops of apple flavored es e uh, essence, uh, one and a half tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, and the white miso, and you paint that on top of that fat on the ham. Wow. And then you put the skin back on top of it, and the skin basically is going to stop it from burning and it's going to cook all of that miso into the fat. And I've got some little sticks that are used for traditionally used for eating a corn cob. We don't eat corn yeah. anymore since we've gone low carb. So I just jam them straight into the skin to stick it to the meat. Yeah. Uh, I, I smoke uh, meat often, and so I'll often have a ham in the middle rack just for 30 minutes to, just to get some smoky flavor in. Right. Then I put it in the oven, and I cook it for about an hour on low temperature in the oven. And uh, the whole point of that is for the fat to not quite render so it drips out liquid, but it cooks down just a little bit with the flavors. And so you end up with a really flavorsome bark around the outside of your ham. Yeah, that sounds and great. some of the flavor goes through it. So that's, that's, that's Julie's miso apple uh, ham. Sounds so good. And I'll put link. I'll put links in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not hungry, but I could totally have a bite of that right now. Yeah. No problem. So that's my recipe. And you spent the whole day with giving us recipes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I sort of felt obligated to, since uh, you really didn't have the Thanksgiving experience, uh, at least not all that much, and uh, don't yeah. really have the turkey and stuffing uh, down under, but. Uh, uh, I sort of, and, and believe me, it was no uh, sacrifice on my part. <laughs> I enjoy nothing more than spending the whole day shopping, cooking, and then eating a meal with my friends. Yeah. It's like a perfect day. And it's awesome because at least 30% of our listeners are outside of America. So this gives everyone an opportunity to have a Thanksgiving weekend. Sure. Why mm. not? Yeah. It's, it's really all about just good food and friends and family. And, and having gone through the keto adventure since January that you have, uh, both of us have been through the keto adventure, we've got plenty of reasons to be thankful. Yes, we do. I'm thankful for you, my friend. <laughs> and I'm thankful for your meal because I'm going to get it in my belly. <laughs> All right. So that's the show, Richard. Yeah. If you've got anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, or some more research that you've found to support or refute what we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. 
Or you can follow us on Twitter at Two Keto Dudes or on Instagram at Two Keto Dudes. And uh, our blog is blog.2keto.com. Our recipe archive is at recipes.2keto.com. Hey, yeah. the fathead pizza is at pizza.2keto.com. <laughs> the chocolate mousse is at moose.2keto.com. <laughs> and the list goes on and on. Uh, a list of links. Critical Science is at links.2keto.com. And of course, if you want to join us on our Facebook group, it's at fb.2keto.com. Keep calm and keto on, Richard. Keep calm and keto on, Kyle. All right. And we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Dudes.